Imagine for a moment that you hire someone to paint your house. And now you contract with them, you meet with them, and you discuss what you want to have done, and you contract and you decide that they're going to paint not just, you know, one room, not just one wall, not just one room, but all the rooms in your house. And you come to this agreement, you come to a price, you're so excited because you're going to get that new paint color on the wall. Maybe some of you would be more excited than somebody like me would, but nonetheless, that could be exciting, especially if you need some paint on the wall and you, get, you come to this agreement. Maybe you have to get some supplies and you have to go pick up something for the painter who's going to do the painting for you. So the first day comes and you're excited and perhaps he's excited, you don't know, but he's going to start painting. And he gets started and he's about two hours into it, maybe three hours into it, and you're like, you know what, let me go check on him. You know, create the variables as such where you're around that day and you're able to go check on this painter and you walk in to one of the rooms that he's painting and you just see him sitting down looking at one of the four walls in the room and just looking at just one wall that he had painted while the other walls remain unpainted. Now you wouldn't be, you know, necessarily angry but you'd be curious at least to wonder what, he, what is he doing and you'd probably ask something like this, hey, is everything okay? <laughs> Are you okay? Now create the context as such that it doesn't look like the guy's just taking a water break. It doesn't look like he's like, you know, out of breath and something health concern is happening. He's just sitting there looking at that one wall that's painted, waiting for that one wall's paint to dry. Now when you come to that conclusion, you realize that's, what ha that's what's happening and he's fine and there's no real reason for him to do this. You could be thinking something like this. Really? I'm paying you by the hour. We came to an agreement here, and there are other walls in this room that could be painted. Maybe you can get some primer on the other walls over there. And when you ask him what's going on, what are you doing? He's just, no, nah. he's just saying, I'm just waiting. I'm just waiting for the paint to dry. And you'd be saying something like, now you can wait for the paint to dry. I understand that. You have to wait for the paint to dry. You can't just put the second coat right over the first coat. I get that. But you can work while you wait. There's a right way to wait, and there's a wrong way to wait. And you could say that one of the themes in this parable is that Jesus is trying to instruct his servants about a right way to wait for him. A right way to wait for his glorious return. We'll see that, but before we see that unpacked in the text that is before us this morning, first let's recall the verses that are right behind us so as to create some context. Last week... We saw that after the crowd heard Jesus' commentary about Zacchaeus' salvation, as well as his own mission, they had some misconceptions. They heard Jesus say, Luke 19, verse 10, For the Son of Man has come to seek and save that which was lost. And when they heard that, they thought something like this. That is great news. He has come to restore the kingdom of Israel. That which was lost, Israel's independence and former glory, is about to be restored by this Messiah. That's what they were thinking. At least something like that. And you didn't find that out in our study of Luke 19, verses 1 through 10. You have to find that out in Luke 19, verse 11, where we're told that Jesus spoke this parable to them for this reason. I'm going to quote from verse 11. As they heard these things, those are the things like the commentary about Zacchaeus' salvation and his own mission, Luke 19, verse 9 and 10. He spoke another parable to them because he was near Jerusalem and because they thought the kingdom of God would appear immediately. So this parable was spoken to correct their erroneous supposition. Namely, most immediately, that they thought they're going to come over the horizon of the Mount of Olives. They're going to continue this trek through Jericho. And before you know it, the kingdom is going to appear in Jerusalem. That's what they were thinking. And Jesus spoke this parable to the end that he might correct that erroneous misconceptions. Jesus wants to correct people's erroneous misconceptions about what he's going to do and when he's going to do it. We saw that last week. But then came the opening three verses of the parable in which we were introduced to the three main set of characters. The first character we're introduced to in verse 12 is the nobleman, the man of noble birth, a title that was well suited to represent Jesus Christ because he is a man who was of incredibly noble birth. 
to use language from Romans chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. He was born according to the seed of David, born by the seed of David according to the flesh. So he was royalty, humanly speaking. But then Paul shows how his birth was greater still in verse 4. He was the Son of God with power. He was shown to be, demonstrated to be, the Son of God with power, according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. So a man of noble birth, this character in this parable, well suited to represent Jesus. But also what he did was well suited to correct their erroneous misconception about what he was going to do. Because the nobleman, you find out in verse 12, is going away on a far journey, which implies chronological distance. The nobleman's taken off on a far journey, and he's not going to be back for a while. So the people who thought the kingdom of God's going to appear immediately have that implicitly corrected in verse 12. And I won't unpack this in great detail because we did last week. Remember the backdrop here was very familiar to the people in Jericho especially because they had seen something like this happen in their recent history via Archelaus after Herod had died in 4 AD in his will, his most recent will, he determined that his son Archelaus, one of four sons that was living, would take his throne. But it didn't work that way in the Roman Empire. You couldn't just pass on the throne to whoever you chose in your will. They would have to appear to a higher king to receive the kingdom, namely Caesar. So Archelaus goes and makes this journey to Caesar. And we said this was not without controversy because he shed a lot of blood shortly before he left. We explained that in the last message. And when he went to go see Caesar, the Jewish people sent a delegation to follow him, saying something like this, We will not have this man reign over us. So Jesus is essentially saying in the opening verses of this parable, what the Jewish people did to Archelaus is essentially going to happen to me even though I'm not Archelaus. So we unpacked those parallels and those contrasts last week. But back to the introduction of the characters. In verse 13, we're introduced to the ten servants, each who were entrusted with a minna from their master. A master. <laughs> the minna was the equivalent of three months' worth of wages. That's what the master had entrusted to each one of these ten servants. Now we said, looking a little bit ahead in the parable, that these ten servants represent the professing church, which is comprised of the faithful as well as the pseudo. You don't find that out in verse 13. You find that out as the parable goes on. And each is entrusted with a minna. And the minna represents, and you have two trains of thought here, and I'm going to tell you why I go with the both end approach. One train of thought would say, well, I think the minna in this parable represents that which is entrusted equally to all Christians. And the reason why somebody would say that is because they're going to look at the parable of the talents in Matthew 25 and see where the servants are given different weights of a thing. They're given different distributions. And somebody would say, okay, that represents the different gifts that Christians are given. Whereas here, every one of the professing servants are given one mina each. So I get that. I get that train of thought. But I think the both end approach is much more appropriate to say there are things that every one of us are equally entrusted with in the professing church, i.e. the gospel or time for prayer or access to God in prayer. We all have equal claim on those things. But I think we should see this as both ends, as the minna also representing that which you're going to have to give an account for when Jesus comes back. Even those things that are distinctively yours to account for. I think that's more of the ultimate sense of the parable, given that we will have to give an account for that too on the day of judgment. Now, then there were the citizens. They had hated the noblemen without a cause. Because there's no cause given in verse 14 as to why they hated him. But they hated him nonetheless. And they openly opposed his rule. And they sent a delegation after him saying, We will not have this man reign over us. Now these citizens most immediately represent unbelieving Israel. Because Jesus was born King of the Jews. He came to his own, i.e. the Jewish people. And his own received him not. Pilate asked the Jewish crowd, Shall I crucify your king? And they said, We have no king but Caesar. 
But by the time you get to the end of the parable, you can see that even though most immediately it reflects the Jews, ultimately it reflects anyone in God's earth, past, present, or future, who would say, we will not have this king reign over us. In the most ultimate sense, everyone, by virtue of God having created us, and Psalm 47 saying that God is the king of all the earth, we are all citizens of his kingdom, not in the Philippians 3.20 saved citizens sense, but in the sense in which we all are under his reign and authority, whether we know it or not, whether we deny it, whether we pretend it doesn't exist, or whether we embrace it. It's nonetheless true. That gets us to our verse, opening verse this morning. Having seen the pre-departure preparations along with the citizens' attempt at preventing the nobleman's reign, we come now to the nobleman's return. We begin in Luke 19, verse 15, where we read, And so it was that when he returned, having received the kingdom, he then commanded these servants to whom he had given the money to be called to him, that he might know how much every man had gained by trading. So this is a trend, transitional part of the parable. The parable transitions from the nobleman's leaving to the nobleman's returning. He went to a faraway country to receive for himself a kingdom. That was verse 11. We saw that that referenced Jesus' ascension when he ascended to the Father to be seated at his right hand and coronated as Lord of Lords, King of Kings. But now we transition to the return. To the return. He returned, having received the kingdom. As the parallels to Jesus have been apparent and evident thus far, they are again here. This is in reference now to the second advent the second coming, the return of the Lord Jesus Christ, which is explicitly referred to or implicitly referred to in many of the Lord's parables. One text that references it very explicitly is Revelation 19, when Jesus is depicted as riding on a white horse, wearing many crowns, and having a name written on His robe and on His thigh, King of kings and Lord of lords. So while Revelation 19 depicts the brief battle that happens at his return, Luke 19 depicts the reckoning that happens upon his return and the rewarding. You see the first example of that in this verse. We're told that the nobleman, now king, commanded these servants to whom he had given the money to be called to him, that he might know how much every man had gained by trading. The first thing I want you to say is that everyday life for these servants got interrupted at this point. There is a fixed day in God's calendar when all of human history is going to be interrupted, if you will, by the glorious return of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's a good reminder that the promised accounting that is referred to here, the promised reckoning that is referred to here, is inevitable. Inevitable. Some of us were together for a time of fellowship on Thursday night, and part of what we did is we played Scattergories. And if some of you are familiar with Scattergories, one of the things that you have to do, or the thing you have to do in Scattergories, is you get a letter that's selected, and then you have these lists. And you have about 12 things on this list. And you go list by list, and you've got to put, you've got to name, choose a name that begins with the letter that's selected. So you've got to do that. And it's kind of hard, because you get about maybe two minutes. I haven't timed the timer, but you get about two minutes. And you're thinking, and you're trying to think of all the words that you could put to answer these categories with letters that begin with whatever the letter is, S, T, R, A, B. And one of the things about it, on a micro level, is that you feel the pressure because you know there's coming a moment. I know it's categories, but bear with me. <laughs> there's coming a moment when you just can't put anything else down. You know, if you put like, if it's the letter A and you've got to think of words that begin with A to match the categories on the paper, you could have A, you know, let's say you're going to say Apple, and you've got A, P, P, and it's looking great. If you don't get L and E down there, time's up. 
Unless the people are very gracious who are playing with you and they don't want to be too stringent. But there's that feeling all of a sudden, eh, you're going to hear it. Time's up. You can't do anymore now. It's done. You have to give an account. Whatever you've done, that's what you've done. Show it. Read it to everybody. Tell them what you've put down on the paper. And on a much more grand and cosmic scale, there is coming a moment of time when people, believers and unbelievers, in different ways, which I'll explain in a moment, will give an account to God. And when that moment comes, you can't go back. You can't add on. You can't do anything like that. The moment of accounting has arrived. It has arrived. I think it's good for us to remember that not only do we have a measured amount of time to steward the opportunities, the responsibilities, and the privileges that are entrusted to us, but we also have a limited amount of time until the Master demands an account from us. Now, Another takeaway from this portion of the parable is Jesus expects his servants to take his command seriously. Right? I think we've all had teachers in school who have given homework assignments but never really checked those homework assignments. You know what I mean? Like they'll give you these assignments and then the first time you hear it, you're like, "Uh uh-oh, okay, they they mean business. That's a few things. I got to go home and do it tonight. And then you have it all done and you come into class the next day and you're expecting for them to check and you're kind of excited that they're going to check it because you put the time in and you put a lot of time into that and you want to show what you did and they just move on. They just move on to some other stuff and then they give you some more homework assignments and maybe you think, okay, maybe they forgot that day. Maybe they're going to remember this day and they don't do that. And after a while, you're like, okay, they're just giving homework assignments, but they're never going to really check on it. Jesus is not like that. He is not going to forget the assignment that He's entrusted to you. You will stand before Him and you will give an account to Him. He expects you, if you are a professing Christian, to conduct, to use the language from verse 13, kind of carried over, He expects you to conduct gospel business using those responsibilities opportunities that He's given you to maximize His fame, the edification of His church, and the spread of His truth, and He will check that assignment. As it pertains to believers, the New Testament references what's referred to as the Bema Seed of Christ. You could look in places like 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 10-15, through 15, and Romans chapter 14, verses 10-12, through 12, which bear witness, each coming at it from different angles, that believers who have believed the gospel and have entered heaven not by their works, but by the work of Christ. Not by what they've done, but by what Christ has done. Not by their own merit, but by the grace-granted faith in the person of work of Jesus Christ. Those people, forgiven, clean, washed, will nonetheless have a face-to-face accounting with Jesus Christ. To get a little bit of that, Romans 14, beginning in the second half of verse 10, we read, For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Now remember, this isn't a judgment seat for believers that determines whether or not you get into heaven. This is, you're here, you're forgiven, but you still have to give an accounting. The judgment seat of Christ, as opposed to the great white throne judgment referred to in Revelation 20, That throne, the throne of Christ, is where rewards are given, where an accounting is given, or where the loss of rewards is also seen. That's what's happening at that throne. At the great white throne, that is the throne where all will stand who have rejected the lordship of Jesus Christ, who have said, I will not have this man reign over us. And then what God does is God opens the books and He says, okay, then you have no penalty remover for your sins. Now, we're going to open the books and you're going to be judged by your works and then you're going to be sentenced into the lake of fire. That's not the throne we're talking about here. Paul's talking about the judgment seat of Christ, the place where believers go to give an account to their master of their stewardship. He says, For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ, for it is written, As I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. So then each of us shall give an account of himself to God. Back to the parable. The king commanded that his servants be brought to him, and indeed they came. And the first report is given in verse 16. We read, Then came the first, saying, Master, your minna has earned ten minnas. 
Now, you might not be too impressed with that, but let me help you get a little bit more impressed. This was an excellent return on investment. This was about a 1,000% gain if you do the math. This man took three months' worth of wages, and out of that three months' worth of wages that he was entrusted with, he made 30 months' worth of wages. That's pretty impressive. The master was impressed. You should be impressed too, at least somewhat. So that's what's happening here. But furthermore, as not all, but pretty much you know, the majority of commentators note, the servant's words here, I would agree with them, I think imply humility. When he says, Master, your minna has earned ten minas, it's as though he excluded himself from the equation. He doesn't say, Master, check out what I have done. You want to hear my business strategy? You want to hear what I did? Okay, so I, 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 you know, I spread this out. I was diverse with my investment strategy. I went with high yield over here. I went with high risk over there. I went with defensive over here. This is what I did, Master. I was pretty smooth. I was pretty smart. He doesn't do that at all. Excludes himself from the equation. Master, respect, reverence, honor, your minna, i.e. the minna you gave me. I couldn't do this unless you had given it to me. Your minna has earned 10 minutes. I think it's reminiscent of the heart of the Apostle Paul, who in 1 Corinthians 15 says this, verse 10, But by the grace of God I am what I am. So get that attitude right there. And His grace towards me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all. And you're like, uh-oh, is, is He leaving that platform of grace? No, no, no. He's going to sandwich that statement with grace. Because he comes back and he says, Yet not I, but the grace of God which was in me. you got to love that attitude. Whatever I've done, however fast I've run, whatever stewardship I've shown, at the end of the day, Master, it's your minna that has produced ten minas. It's all you at the end of the day. You've worked in me both to will and to do. That doesn't exclude my responsibility to do. There just means that there's a mystery on the other side of this that says, It's grace working in me if anything happens. It's the grace of God in me. I'm supposed to labor. I'm supposed to do that. But there's a mystery happening if I do that. I don't have to figure out the mystery. I don't have to dissect it. I don't have to fully explain it. I just have to know what's happening. By the grace of God, I am what I am. And whatever I do, you know, Apostle Paul, if I labor more abundantly than them all, Apostle Paul comes back and says, yet not I, but the grace of God working in me. So this servant was productive. This servant demonstrated humility. But there was a characteristic about him that was particularly noticeable to the master. And we see that in verse 17. And he said to him, that's the king, Well done, good servant. Because you were faithful in a very little, have authority over ten cities. Now we'll come to the characteristic that is seen by the king here in a moment. But first, let's just kind of walk through the text together. To be highly commended by somebody that you respect means a lot. To have the king give you a notable commendation, well done, good servant, is more than just simple words. It's simple words, especially, it's simple words, but when you consider the import and who's saying it, they are significant words. Especially when you consider the words spoken here foreshadow the words that Jesus will speak to his servants who have been good servants. It's hard for me to imagine words that would thrill my heart more than, and I'm tying this together to the first time that I heard my wife, before she was my wife, because this would be bad if the first time I heard what I'm about to say it was after she became my wife. The first time I heard my wife say, I love you. I just, that thrilled my heart. Like, really? This girl who I, I am in love with and I think is incredible, she loves me? And then I'm tying it to, the, to, to even now. Even when the other day was her birthday and we were just looking at one another and we're so thankful that God has given us one another and she says those words, I love you. It's like, really? This dream has come true and God has given me you? It's hard to imagine words meaning more to my heart than hearing her say, I love you. But it's not hard to imagine the words of Jesus exceeding even those exceedingly precious words. To hear Jesus Christ, look at me, 
and say, well done, good servant. Or to pick it up from Matthew 25, the parable of the talents, well done, good and faithful servant. That should thrill every servant of God's heart. If you've seen the cross, if you've seen that Jesus is your Savior who loved you and gave himself for you, to have him when you don't deserve anything, you don't even deserve eternal life, get alone commendation from him, and he's going to say that to you, the prospect of that should thrill your heart. And whatever thrill you experience in the here and now is but a foreshadow of what you will experience should you receive such a commendation when you see him. Because it's possible... Well, we'll talk about this a little bit more. To enter the kingdom of God and to be forgiven, but to be far more barren than you ought to have been. We'll see that a little bit later on in the text. But the prospect of those words should thrill our hearts. And why did the king commend his servant? Was it because his servant was successful? Was it because his servant was productive? All right, servant, you made ten. You are productive, you are strategic, I like it, you are successful. To really hone in on the text, we notice that what follows the because is a specific characteristic about the servant that isn't necessarily tied to a servant's success. In this case, it was. He says, Well done, good servant, because you were faithful in a very little, have authority over ten cities. He didn't neglect the responsibilities that were before him by dreaming about bigger responsibilities that weren't. He embraced the responsibilities that he had. He was faithful. And granted, his faithfulness is connected to his fruitfulness. But the ground of his fruitfulness was the God-granted faithfulness. That's what the Master noted. That was the characteristic that he highlighted. And then you have to see the grace that is on display here. There is amazing grace on display here. You've been faithful in a little. Three months worth of wages. And what do you get as a, ret as a result, as a return? Authority over ten cities? That's amazing. <laughs> it's what Ligon Duncan refers to as the disproportionate grace of God. To which I say, well said. Because that is that. Imagine, three months worth of wages, really good job. You've made 30 months worth of wages. Okay, you know what I'm going to give you? Here, ten cities, rule over them. As under me, as a kind of vice regent, as it were. You're meant to see the character of the king here. Because you're going to see that the pseudo-servant, a little bit later on, Lord willing, next week, his fundamental problem is that he didn't see this aspect of the king's character. He was blind to it. You have to see this aspect of the king's character. He's gracious. He's generous. He's kind. He's giving. That's who he is. That's who he is. And you see it on display right here. And that shouldn't surprise us because we already know God to be the most generous being. Because not only has He made His elect to be heirs of His and joint heirs with Christ, not only has He promised His elect that they will inherit the kingdom and inherit the earth, not only that, but His generosity is most climactically displayed in the fact that He offered up, He gave His only Son. We know our God to be an amazingly generous God who did not spare His only Son, but offered, up, offered Him up for us all. And then we say with the Apostle Paul, how shall He not with Him also freely give us all things? As though He gave us that which was greatest, is He not going to give us that which is least? Amazing. Furthermore, we should notice that this servant's promotion came in proportion to his faithful service. And what was he rewarded with? Further responsibility and further opportunities for service. This gives us a great glance of the foreshadowing of what awaits us in the coming kingdom. The coming kingdom, I would argue, in the millennial earth and the coming kingdom even in the eternal state where according to Revelation 22, his servants will serve him. So this is a prelude. What's happening now is an apprenticeship, a preparation for what is coming. 
Remember, Jesus told the church of Laodicea that the one who overcomes would sit with him on his throne even as he overcame and sat on his father's throne. Shared authority under the authority of Jesus Christ. Revelation 3, 21. Saints will have the responsibility to judge angels. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 3. The apostles, for example, will judge over the twelve tribes of Israel. Matthew 2, 19, 28. 2 Timothy 2.12 says, If we endure with Him, we will also reign with Him. So the coming kingdom, the reality that you don't see right now, but it's as real as the moment that you are enjoying right now, the coming kingdom that is coming will comprise opportunities for faithful servants to share in the administration of Christ's authority. I would argue on the millennial earth, and then to whatever degree, whatever that looks like, in the eternal state, because service will still be happening even in the eternal state. There will be rest, but there will not be inactivity. And there will not only be service, but there will be delegated authority. Wow. This point is reiterated in the evaluation of the second servant. But first, he comes forth, and we see that verse 18. And the second came, saying, Master, your minna has earned five minas. So this servant demonstrates the same humility as the first, the same respect as the first. He approaches the nobleman, calls him Master, acknowledges his lordship, and he lives in a way that is commiserate with that statement of his lordship. And he told the Master, your minna has earned five minas. Now, just an observation. I can't take this too far because the text doesn't. But I'm just going to give it to you by way of observation. You do notice here that this servant is not commended in the same way that the prior servant was. And even when you go on into the parable, as you move on, the first servant is distinguished from this servant because he is entrusted with even further responsibility. Now, some would go so far as to say, well, this may be because this person, this servant, did well, but he could have done better. I think it's worth observing. I don't know if I can go that far because, for example, in the parable of the talents, when you see both servants who are commended, both of them are told, well done, good and faithful servant. But nonetheless, I think it is worth observing. And I think it helps us to have a mentality like the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 9, verses 24 to 27, to run as one that will win the race. Not as though we're in competition with one another. We have our own race to run. And we want to make sure we run our individual race in a way that the Lord would say, well done, good and faithful servant. But nonetheless, he's... he's Go into the master, tells him he's earned, his master's minna has earned five minas, and then likewise, the master says to him, verse 19, you also be over five cities. So again, the disproportionate generosity of God is on display. This servant earned five minas, about 15 months worth of wages. Not even two years, not even a year and a half. And what does he get? Authority over five cities. Amazing grace, kindness on display. And again, it's proportional. It's in proportion to the faithfulness that he displayed, which led to the fruitfulness that he produced. So there we see. The second one had him one minna and was faithful to the degree that he was able to present to the king five minas, and both were rewarded proportionally. And again, the theme rings true. The rewards and responsibilities to come are in proportion to the faithful service in the here and now. That's biblical reality. So on one level, I want to make this point before I get to our final application for the sake of preparation, but I want to make this point. We come to the cross of Jesus Christ as sinners. And through the cross, our sins are forgiven. When we believe, when we repent of our sins and put our faith in the personal work of Christ alone for forgiveness, we are forgiven. We receive eternal life. We enter heaven not by our works, but by the work of God in Christ. However, the scripture is so true to, and so faithful to tell us over and over again that what's coming is going to be a time of rewards and reckoning that is in proportion to what those who have been forgiven do with what they've been given right now. We can't miss that. Okay. So now, 
what I want to do this morning, rather than moving on in the parable, I want to close with an application for the sake of preparation. Because hopefully some of you are thinking something like this. Okay, if this moment is coming when I'm going to have to stand before Jesus... Tell me, as somebody who's forgiven, loved by God, forgiven by God, eternally going to be with God and angels and saints forever, as somebody who is that person, how do I prepare for this reckoning even though I'm forgiven, even though I'm loved? Help me, Pastor George. Tell me. What does the Scripture say? How can I prepare for this moment? That's what I wanted to do. Because I think if you're going to understand how to maximize the minna that God has entrusted to you, you have to have as a backdrop what the Scripture says about that day. So what I'm going to do right now is give you a little bit of a backdrop of what's going to happen and what you're going to be accountable for and what you can do in the here and now to prepare for that moment so when that day comes, you can, by the grace of God, present ten minas, as it were, to your master, to your king. So first, I want to pick up from 2 Corinthians 5, verses 9 and 10. There, the Apostle Paul is speaking about the judgment seat of Christ. Again, the place where believers who are forgiven and loved go to be evaluated by Jesus. So this is some counsel for you about the things you could do to prepare for that moment, to maximize your minna, if you will. There, the Apostle Paul writes, Therefore, we make it our aim, whether present or absent, to be well-pleasing to Him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. See the connection there? We make it our aim to be pleasing to Him. That's our mentality. Wherever we are, we just want to be pleasing to Him. For, because of this reason, we must appear before the judgment seat of Christ. We, forgiven Corinthians, you and me, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or or bad. You can carry that over to the illustration that Paul uses, or, or the way basically Paul outlines the way the, our works will be tested in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 10 through 15. When he describes our works and the things that we have done as being tested by fire, and some of those works, if they are going to endure and they were done for the glory of God and they were done with right motives, they will be shown to be Gold, silver, precious stones. It's as though you're building something. And if the fire that your works are tested in shows that those works remain, they were gold, silver, precious stones by the way God defined them. If they weren't, if they were works done under compulsion or with wrong motives or wrong intent, they'll be shown to be wood, hay, and stubble. They're going to be burned up on that day. So the Apostle Paul says we make it our aim to be pleasing to Him because we're going to have to give an account. Okay, you go on and you can see that God is going to, even as I just alluded to, take inventory of our motives, the reasons why we do things. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 5 says, Therefore judge nothing before the time until the Lord comes, who will bring both to light the hidden things of darkness and reveal the counsels of the hearts. Then... Each one's praise will come from God. So God evaluating our motives, don't necessarily think of that as a bad thing. I think some people think He's going to evaluate our motives. That's bad. No, hopefully that's very good. Then each one will receive praise from God. 1 Corinthians 4, 5. Like you did something for someone and they had no idea of how much love you had for them and how much love you had for Christ. But on that day, when He evaluates your works, it'll be shown, even though it was a little thing, for example, to be gold because it was precious, even though people didn't notice it. So there's a positive aspect to it. But of course, there's also a negative aspect to it. I did whatever it was because I wanted to be seen by whoever it was. That's going to be wood, hay, stubble. It's going to be burned up. Wrong motives. Not for the love of God, not for the love of the person. So... Evaluate your motives to prepare for that day. I also think that there's instruction for that day of accounting by way of looking at the different crowns that the Apostle Paul mentions. I think if you look at those crowns that he refers to, not just him, but Peter and James refer to crowns as well. Just glance at what they are and you could say, okay, I want to see that so I can have my eyes on that so I can be prepared in the hopes of receiving a a commendation that befits that. For example... In 1 Corinthians 9, 24-27, the Apostle Paul is, and I'll put this in my words, 
calling us to embrace purposeful self-sacrifice for the sake of the gospel, looking towards the moment where we will receive an imperishable crown. So if you want to prepare for that day, embrace self-sacrifice purposefully for the sake of the gospel. Right? Not just self-sacrifice for the sake of it, you know? You know, don't wake up in the middle of winter and go sit in a river and ponder your wickedness and think God's going to be pleased with that. Not that any of you would do that, but let's say you did. God's not going to be impressed with that. That's not purposeful self-sacrifice. Purposeful self-sacrifice is the kind of sacrifice that says, even though this is going to infringe upon my time and my comfort and my desires, I know it's going to glorify God. I know it's going to help somebody else. In 2 Thessalonians, or 1 Thessalonians, chapter 2, verses 19 to 20, the Apostle Paul was looking forward to the crown of rejoicing. It's what many people refer to as the crown associated with pursuing leading people to Christ. But the interesting thing is Paul describes those people as being the crown. He tells the Thessalonians, what is my joy and my crown on that day of the Lord Jesus Christ? Is it not you? As though to say to them, on that day when I see you, it's not just, oh, I love all Christians equally. Maybe you do love all Christians equally, but you're going to remember those Thessalonians in a special way. You are my joy. You are my crown. I had the privilege of leading you to the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And maybe, to tie it in with Luke 16, they will be part of those who will welcome you into eternal habitations with praise. A little bit more about that in a moment. Well, if you're a pastor... If you're aspiring to be a pastor, or if you're an elder within a local church, Peter calls you, calls me, to pursue being a faithful pastor that shepherds the flock, feeds the flock, exercises godly oversight of the flock, and serves as an example to the flock, looking for the moment when the chief shepherd will appear, and you, elder, pastor, will receive a crown of glory that doesn't fade away. That helps prepare you for that moment too because you know that the crown of glory that's referred to there is connected to that which He calls you to do. Feed the flock. Shepherd the flock. Not with compulsion, but with willingness. Exercise godly oversight. Do these things. Serve as an example. And look. Eyes on the skies, as it were. And wait for the chief shepherd to appear to give the crown of glory. James... In James chapter 1, verse 12, he speaks about those who have endured trials, temptations, those who endure them. He calls such a man blessed, and he promises that they will receive the crown of life. So it's as though God would have you to receive the encouraging promises that God has given His people to hold on to in the midst of trial. And when you hold on to it in the midst of trial, and you persevere, and you honor God, and you praise God, James is saying on the other end of that, there is a crown of life that awaits. The least of which you could say is, it doesn't go unnoticed by God. It will be commended by God even though ultimately it was nonetheless wrought by the grace of God. Now one more place that I want to go before I bring it back to the maximization of your minna. I want you to hear from 1 Peter, from 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 5 through 11. Because I think it's going to paint a brilliant picture in your mind, and it's going to remind you of another way to prepare for that day. Cultivate godly virtues. God wants you to be in the process of cultivating Christ-likeness in your life. So I'm going to pick up 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 5. But also for this very reason, that very reason being because God has given you all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of Him, and by the grace of God and the gospel, you are partakers of the divine nature, the Holy Spirit being joined to your spirit. For this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, to virtue, knowledge, to knowledge, self-control. To self-control, perseverance. To perseverance, godliness. To godliness, brotherly kindness. And to brotherly kindness, love. Give all diligence to add these things. He goes on in verse 8 and he says, For if these things are yours and abound in you, 
you will neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these things is short-sighted even to blindness and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. So you could be a believer and you could be far more barren than you ought to be. Cleansed from your old sins, yet so unproductive. Now, that's a dangerous place because there are probably people who think that they're, they're just unproductive believers when they're not believers. But there is a category for this in the Word of God. That's not a tightrope that you want to walk on because you don't know where you ultimately really are in that case. But nonetheless, it's possible. So he says, Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure. Quick note here. I love this. He's not telling them to do this to get into the kingdom. He's not saying add all these things so you make sure you get into the kingdom of God. He's, he's saying grace is the foundation here. Make sure your election, that which was decided before the foundation of the world, just make sure that it's sure. Make sure you know that that's who you are. You're standing on a platform of grace. All this stuff doesn't help maintain you in heaven at all. But nonetheless, he'll, he'll show you what it does in a moment. Be diligent to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never stumble. That's part one. So you have this assurance that you are saved. But here comes the other part of it. For so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Peter is exhorting believers to prepare for themselves what he calls here an abundant entrance into the kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. He doesn't want you to be somebody who's described in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 15 as somebody who just gets saved as though by fire. He wants you to be somebody who makes your way into the kingdom with this abundant entrance. What does that abundant entrance mean? What does it look like? Well, some suggest that the backdrop here is the homecoming that the Greek Olympians would come home to and the way the people would celebrate their return and they would make an abundant re-entry back into their hometown and the people would prepare and would celebrate. That's kind of the idea of what Peter's talking about here. It's as though when you are filled with fruitfulness, don't forget Philippians chapter 1, verse 11, that that fruitfulness is by Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. The Bema seat judgment that happens doesn't happen in a closet. It's not like God's going to take you, like, come into my quiet closet, let me give you an evaluation. This this is a public thing. And when it happens, the end of all that isn't just you. So if you were to say, I don't really want an abundant entrance. I just want to sneak in. I'll be happy. I don't care if anybody even knows who I am. I'll just be happy to be there. That's not the mentality you should have. The mentality you should have is that the fruits that are produced by Jesus Christ, Philippians 1.11, are to the glory and praise of God. So this abundant entrance, this fruitfulness that is displayed at the Bema Seat of Christ is ultimately to His glory and to His praise. And again, to reference back to Luke chapter 16, verse 10, this may be another example of when Jesus spoke about using, for example, earthly wealth to make heavenly friends who will welcome you into heavenly habitations. The idea being your support of gospel ministry, your support of missions, has led to me hearing the gospel and I'm so excited. I never got to meet you on earth, but welcome home. An abundant entry into the kingdom. So, those are the things that you want to have in mind to maximize your minna, (laughs) as it were. But so we don't forget, what does it look like to maximize the minna that God has entrusted to you? You've been entrusted with the gospel. How do you maximize that? You embrace it you treasure it, you make it known. You teach it to your children. You seize opportunities to share it with your co-workers. You take this gospel that you've received, and as a steward, you treasure it, and you maximize it. You take, for example, your children, and you pray with them, and you desire to teach them, and you maximize your opportunity. God has given you however many minutes in the course of a day with your child. And let's say you take 15 minutes a day to teach them something from the Bible. Then what you're doing ultimately is going to bear much more fruit than those 15 minutes. You're maximizing your minute. You took 15 minutes, you invested it, and now you're maximizing it. Because that child may remember those verses, those stories, for the rest of his or her life. We talked last week about using work as more than work. That work is your ministry. 
that you see it as that and you esteem the responsibility and the privilege and you're thinking of ways that you could display the compassion and the kindness of Jesus at work. You're thinking of ways in which your work can be a testimony that you are a Christian who lives out the Christian ethic that Jesus demands. There are so many ways. You attend times of corporate worship and corporate prayer and you make the most out of it. You don't just come in and walk out. You're like, okay, you know what? I'll be... I'll be in, but as soon as it ends, I'm going out. No, you want to maximize it. You want to meditate on the Word of God. You want to talk to God when we pray. You want to sing to God. You want to take opportunities to encourage somebody else. Maybe pray for somebody else. You're maximizing those opportunities, privileges, and responsibilities that God has given to you. That's what it looks like to maximize your minna. Think about what God has given and say, how can I maximize this for God's glory and for the good of others? For the spread of Jesus' renown. That, if you will is what the first and second servant did. It's not what the third servant did. But we'll see that, Lord willing, next week when we come back to the conclusion of this parable. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for your word. And as someone who stands on the foundation of the gospel of grace, to think that you would commend servants like me, like us, and grant us even more grace. It's amazing. You are amazingly kind, overwhelmingly generous and gracious. And we pray, Heavenly Father, that you would continue to work in us the humility that befits your servants. May we say like the Apostle Paul, your minna has done all this. Yet not I, but the grace of God in me has done whatever good has come from my life. So Father, I pray for your church May you continue to work in us so that we will be a people who give you all the glory to know that the fruits of righteousness are by Jesus Christ, that he is the vine and we are the branches and apart from him we could do nothing. But in that platform, on that platform, help us to heed the counsel of Peter to add to our faith the things that he described in that passage, brotherly kindness and love and virtue and knowledge and perseverance and self-control. I pray, Father, make us a people that are so diligent, who are so waiting for that moment to see the Son and to hear His commendation. And so, Father, we thank You. I pray in closing, Lord, that You will have this text in our minds, bearing fruit in our hearts, long after this service concludes. To your glory and praise in Jesus' name, amen.